Today, Las Vegas is home to two million people. Each month, 6,000 new residents settle in the Clark County area, making Las Vegas one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Vegas is also the number one destination spot in the world, surpassing the theme park draw of Orlando, Florida in 1999 and the spiritual pull of Mecca in 2001. In 2006, Las Vegas drew in an estimated 40 million visitors. It boasted a total of over 130,000 hotel rooms, powered 15,000 miles of lighted neon tubing, housed more than 200,000 slot machines, and used over 22 million megawatt hours of electricity. However, the railroad spawn town site of just 100 years earlier bears little resemblance to the booming tourist destination of today. In fact, in 1905, when Las Vegas was founded, few would have guessed its potential. Well, Las Vegas was a very unlikely spot to become an important city. It had always been an oasis. There's a tremendous amount of snow melt that comes off Mount Charleston to the west of us and goes underground into aquifers before running down towards the Colorado River. But there was no threat of it becoming a town until the railroad. In 1905, Senator William Andrews Clark, in partnership with the Union Pacific Railroad, finished a route between Southern California and Salt Lake City, Utah, as a shortcut to Chicago and New York markets. Because of the steam locomotive's need for water, Clark designed a stopping point in the small oasis of Las Vegas. And so he decided to, to buy 2,000 acres from Helen Stewart, who owned a ranch here and he used her water rights and her land to build a small town. On May 15th, Clark put the land up for auction and the first Las Vegans started moving in. In its early stages, Las Vegas relied almost entirely on the railroad for employment. Las Vegas was almost a company town. The town was laid out in relation to where the tracks ran. The repair yards were set up near town. And from the beginning, Las Vegas was really a 24-hour town because it had to serve the railroad and travelers. With the 24-hour town came saloons. But early on, one of the rules laid out by the railroad stated that liquor sales would be limited to a certain area. Referred to as Block 16, this area would also produce the town's first casino gaming. And though Nevada would outlaw gambling in 1909, Block 16 casinos like the Gem and the Arizona Club continued business as usual, making it a popular spot in Southern Nevada. Block 16 evolved into a red light district. They added prostitution to the casinos, second floors, so to speak. During Prohibition, you could go to Block 16 and you could get booze just about any time. Still, the success of Block 16 wouldn't be able to save Las Vegas from its first economic crisis. In 1921, Due to the Railroad Labor Board's decision to cut hourly wages, a union of railroad shop workers began a nationwide strike. Among them were workers in Las Vegas. And when the strike ended, not long afterward, the Union Pacific announced it was moving the repair shops up the line to Caliente, saying it had nothing to do with the strike. Well, maybe, maybe not. But this was a turning point for Las Vegas, the mid and late 1920s, because the train was still going to stop here, but now a lot of the jobs associated with the train had moved. So how does Las Vegas make up the loss? Ironically, this small, somewhat rebellious town in southern Nevada would find help in two unlikely places, the state and federal government. After the stock market crash of 1929, Americans all over the country were thrown out of work. But in a bit of Vegas luck, the federal government had recently signed a bill approving the largest civil engineering project in the United States history, later to be named the Hoover Dam. 
It was planned for construction near Boulder Canyon, just outside of Las Vegas. Every section of the country was called upon to contribute to the staggering quantity and wide diversity of materials required. Thousands of tons of steel, millions of barrels of cement, machinery, gasoline and oil by the thousands of gallons. The engineering forces completed their surveys, working under the most hazardous conditions. And every state in the Union furnished its quota of laborers and artisans. So starting as early as January 1929, people were pouring into southern Nevada. The Boulder Canyon project was worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And workers only had two days off. In fact, they had Thanksgiving and Christmas. Temperatures down in Black Canyon got as high as 140 degrees in the sun. And very early on, they didn't even have chilled water. They didn't have bathrooms, changing room showers. They had nothing for the workers. To house the workers, the federal government began construction on Boulder City, a federally governed town just a stone's throw away from the construction site. Unintentionally, the government's disapproval of the Las Vegas lifestyle would actually help the town's tourism market. Well, Boulder City was built to house the dam workers. It was not built to accommodate visitors. And the federal government was pretty stringent. No drinking, no gambling, no prostitution there. But people come from across the country and around the world to see what's being called the eighth wonder of the world. And you're getting about a quarter of a million people a year coming to look at the dam. So Las Vegas's tourism business becomes tied to the dam. In 1931, when construction began on the Boulder Canyon project, Nevada's state government signed two pieces of legislation which would be essential to the Las Vegas tourist business. The first was relaxing the marriage and divorce laws. The second was the re-legalization of gambling. There was a real estate developer in southern Nevada named Thomas Carroll who was pushing for this. The idea being people will come here, they will have some fun and maybe decide to stay here and keep on spending money and investing. But the popularity of Las Vegas' first legal casinos like the Northern Club and the Apache Hotel was not enough to significantly change its population, which by the end of the 1930s was just over 8,000 people. For Vegas to really boom, it would take a war halfway around the world. The key to the growth of Las Vegas was really World War II. And once again, fighting men stand ready to carry on America's oldest military tradition, to attack, to attack the forces that threaten us. With all the men and all the equipment, we can hurl against them. In World War II, we were filled with defense workers. The newly opened basic magnesium town site and what became Henderson was an important supplier of magnesium for airplanes being made in Southern California. There was also a gunnery school, what is today Nellis Air Force Base, was the Army Gunnery School. There was no Air Force until 1947. The Army handled the flying, the dropping of bombs in World War II, and they trained their gunners uh, here in Vegas, in what would be today North Las Vegas and the federal government will become, for Southern Nevada, a goose that lays the golden egg. By the end of World War II in 1945, Las Vegas's population had nearly doubled, jumping to almost 15,000 people. This meant that the small desert town needed a plan to deliver water to the surge of new residents. And so in the late 1940s, the Las Vegas Valley Water District was created, which is bonding power taxes, many of the people in the valley, and that money was used to build a water line from basic magnesium, which had its water line to Lake Mead, up to Las Vegas. In addition to new residents, the war also brought tourism. Each week, thousands of defense workers from Southern California traveled on the recently paved Highway 91 to enjoy the casinos on their weekends off. At this time, the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce began courting Thomas Hull, the owner of the popular chain of El Rancho Hotels in California, to build a resort-sized hotel on Fremont Street. Noticing the amount of traffic coming up from California, Hull decided to build his resort on Highway 91, 
making the El Rancho Vegas the first hotel on what would later become the famous Las Vegas Strip. Well, the early casinos are small-time operations. They're real casinos, and they have the slot machine or two, and they have some tables, and there's often sawdust on the floors. But the El Rancho Vegas was a step up in both size and class. While still more western in theme, it catered towards high comfort, offering air-conditioned rooms, a pool area, buffets, and live entertainment by the top performers of the day. And so what he did was he created the model for the future strip. Uh, put casino gambling in a resort hotel. This model would be emulated in the mid and late 1940s at both the Last Frontier and the Thunderbird. Even mobster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel followed suit. After a failed attempt at buying the El Rancho Vegas, Siegel took hold of Hollywood businessman Billy Wilkerson's plans to build a new hotel on the Strip. Wilkerson envisioned the Strip as becoming an American Monte Carlo, with his hotel leading the way. Siegel's result was the Flamingo, which replaced Las Vegas's common Western theme with the glitz and glamour of a luxury Hollywood resort. The Flamingo opened December 26, 1946, and opening night was a disaster. It was the worst time of year to open a casino because back then people did not go to Las Vegas between Christmas and New Year's the way they do now. The hotel really wasn't completed, so a lot of people came in there, got all the free food they could, gambled and won a lot of money, and then went somewhere else. After a rocky start that included construction costs skyrocketing millions of dollars over budget and Siegel's murder in June of 1947, the Flamingo would take on new management and become extremely profitable for its mafia backers in New York. The Flamingo's success influenced others from the underworld of organized crime to follow the Thomas Hull model. In the 50s, you didn't go to college and get a degree in gambling. So if you're going to run a casino well, where did you get your experience? You probably got it in a state where it was illegal. Helping bankroll many of these mafia endeavors were loans from the Teamsters Pension Fund, facilitated by then-president Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa was, in a sense, one of the two bankers for Las Vegas because traditional bankers generally did not lend money for casinos. In the 1950s, Las Vegas began to see a surge of major hotels open on the Strip, each with some mob influence. Among these were the Desert Inn, the Sahara, the Sands, the Dunes, the New Frontier, the Riviera, the Hacienda, the Stardust, and the Tropicana. But as the Mafia gambled the Teamster loans on large resorts, small, legitimate businessmen also realized the favorable odds that the town offered and made similar bets that would turn themselves into future Las Vegas tycoons. It had tremendous growth opportunities. I had looked around and I found a piece of ground right on the strip, right where Harris is today, and bought it for, I didn't have any money, but I bought it for, you know, a dollar down, a dollar a month kind of thing. In 1950, Hank Greenspun began challenging the status quo by publishing The Las Vegas Sun. Hank Greenspun was a major influence in this city. There was this tremendous competition going on between The Las Vegas Sun and The Las Vegas Review Journal, which over the years made Las Vegas one of the few cities in the country that had two competing newspapers. The fact that those two papers were at each other's throat all the time probably also added a lot of life to this city. Certainly added a lot of life to your reading of the newspapers, I can tell you that. There was also high competition among the strip hotels. In an effort to lure customers and beat out the growing competition, entertainment managers hired top name talent from singers like Nat King Cole and Rosemary Clooney to comedians like Milton Berle and Red Skelton. Starstruck guests flocked to see the relatively inexpensive shows and you could go from one lounge to another for a dollar drink and see some of the greatest entertainment in the world right here in Vegas. One hotbed of entertainment was the first integrated hotel in Las Vegas, which opened in 1955 under the name the Moulin Rouge. At the time, the town had long been labeled the Mississippi of the West. The Moulin Rouge was built as a means of uh, 
continue segregation and keeping blacks from off the strip. The hotel would surprisingly have the opposite effect. Eventually, the Moulin Rouge would be used as a meeting ground in which casino owners and black community leaders finally ended segregation on the strip. But until then, the hotel found great success, luring white patrons from the strip to see their favorite black performers, such as Sammy Davis Jr., Pearl Bailey, and Harry Belafonte. As more hotels emerged, the new connection to California through Interstate 15 and the construction of a new airport for commercial jets allowed more tourists than ever to have fast and easy access to Las Vegas. This, mixed with the excitement of the casinos and the allure of top-notch entertainment, made the town a prime spot for the growing business convention market. When President Eisenhower and the Republicans took over the White House and Congress in the 1950s, they passed a whole series of reforms of the income tax code creating what we could call the deduction for the three martini lunch. They made it possible to be able to deduct your travel if you cre created an association and went and listened to speeches, exhibited goods, and basically went to a convention to learn more about your trade every year. This led to the creation of the Las Vegas Convention Center in 1959. It hosted eight conventions in its first year, attended by more than 22,000 delegates. But the entertainment, the gaming, the glitz, and the glamour weren't the only attractions Las Vegas had to offer. Starting in January of 1951, Las Vegas began hosting the greatest fireworks show the world had ever seen, taking place just 65 miles northwest and courtesy of the United States government. America had recently entered the atomic age, and with it would come hundreds of nuclear tests, both above and below ground. The majority of these blasts took place in southern Nevada, on the recently named Nevada Test Site. Curious Las Vegans would venture out to watch the explosions, unknowingly exposing themselves to untold amounts of radiation. I remember when I was in high school, going out and watching uh, atmospheric tests and seeing uh, this psychedelic color, this mushroom coming over the horizon. You believed what government told you, and you know, government had this whole big PR campaign under Louis Strauss, the head of AEC, saying, you'll be safe, just duck and cover, just don't stand next to a plate glass window, just don't look at the blast without sunglasses, you'll be safe. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Duck and cover. Because little was publicly known about the dangers of radiation, Las Vegas publicists used the spectacle to their advantage. Las Vegas, uh, I think historically, has always made the best with what it had to work with, and in those days it had, a, it had an atomic bomb to work with. This would translate to publicity stunts like the Miss Atomic Bomb pageant and drink specials promoting atomic cocktails. And it did create a lot of vitality in the community, a tremendous amount of people coming in, coming and going, whether they were Washington or whether they were workers. Ultimately, the greatest effect the test site would have on Las Vegas was the nearly 100,000 people who worked there over the years, many of whom have stayed in the area. This helped add to an even greater expansion of Las Vegas in the 1960s. Between 1960 and 1970, 10 more major hotels would open on both the Strip and Fremont Street. At the same time, established hotels like the Dunes and the Sands were expanding, with high-rise towers to accommodate the ever-growing number of guests coming to be entertained. The Sands was home to the most popular act of the time, a musical and comedy show starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, and Joey Bishop. Fans lovingly referred to the group as the Rat Pack.
Sure. You can get high watching this show. You set me all aflame, and it's so pleasing. Be a goddamn shame if you were only teasing. When Sinatra was here, every night was New Year's Eve. I mean, it was really exciting. But he made guys like Trini Lopez. I mean, by merely showing up where Trini was working, down on Crescent Heights Boulevard in L.A., Frank took the guys in there two or three or four nights. The word got out, and the joint was a tremendous success, and that was the beginning of Trini's career. In the winter of 1960, the Rat Pack stars performed evening shows at the Sands while filming the Las Vegas-based motion picture Ocean's Eleven. How'd it come off? Like a charm. Same here, fantastic. Along with the 1964 Elvis Presley musical, Viva Las Vegas, Ocean's Eleven helped play up the excitement and entertainment the town had to offer. The films defined Las Vegas in American pop culture for years to come. Truthfully, if my heart's in the right place, the entertainment capital was here in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then when Howard Hughes got here, everything shifted, and the winds changed, and a lot of the ships just sailed away and never came back. On Thanksgiving weekend in 1966, reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas in a two-car private train and took up residence on the top floor of the Desert Inn. And you have to Im imagine that uh, here we were uh, occupying the best, the best uh, accommodations in the hotel. All of, of the Hughes entourage never gambled. We were not, we were not good tenants for a hotel. Uh, we didn't gamble, we didn't have big parties, we didn't have big dinners, and uh, they were getting sick and tired of us, and I mean for real. Finally, when faced with the possibility of being kicked out, Hughes bought the Desert Inn from Cleveland mobster Mo Dalitz for nearly $13 million. Soon afterwards, Hughes realized that his recent sale of Transworld Airlines had left him in an unfavorable tax position that could be best remedied by investing in new businesses. He said, Bob, how many more of these toys are available? I said, what do you mean toys? He said, I mean, how many more of these casinos are available? Increased government investigations influenced many of the mob-based casino owners to sell their hotels. At that particular time, Las Vegas was in dire straits and came along a man who could, for all practical purposes, clean up the image of Las Vegas. And so, during his four years living on the top floor of the Desert Inn, Hughes would buy the Sands, the Frontier, the Castaways, the Silver Slipper, and the Landmark Hotels. He left Las Vegas just as quietly as he came, moving again on Thanksgiving in 1970. But as Howard Hughes was paving the way to a new corporate-controlled Las Vegas, city leaders realized that the growing demand for water meant a need for serious change in distribution. Officials turned to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was then enacting a large number of domestic programs. Senator Howard Cannon and Alan Bible convinced Johnson to build the Southern Nevada Water Project, a major pipeline from Lake Mead directly into Las Vegas. You've got to have water if you're going to have a large population in a big city. By 1969, like many other parts of the country, Las Vegas was divided on the issue of racial integration. Though Vegas casinos had integrated in 1960, school and housing segregation still existed. And in October of 1969, a full-scale riot erupted for two days, causing Governor Paul Laxalt to mobilize the National Guard. Various protests continued for the next few years, giving the tourism-driven town much unwanted publicity. More negative press would follow in the 1970s when an underground novel showed America the dark side of Vegas. In 1971, Hunter S. Thompson took an assignment to write captions for Sports Illustrated's coverage of the Mint 400, a desert off-road race held in Las Vegas. Though Thompson's original 2,500-word manuscript was rejected, he began turning his experience into a novel, documenting the contrast between the American dream image promoted by the Vegas tourism industry and his own darkly comic, drug-induced observations of the town. 
Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas became a pop culture phenomenon and gave a new generation of Americans a darker, more nonsensical conception of what it was like to visit Las Vegas. The circus circus is what the whole half world would be doing on Saturday night if the Nazis had won the war. So you're down on the main floor playing blackjack and the stakes are getting high when suddenly you chance to look up and there, right smack above your head is a half-naked 14-year-old girl being chased through the air by a snarling wolverine. But as the outside perceptions of Las Vegas were changing, so too were the city's internal politics and business methods. After realizing the effect that a respected businessman like Howard Hughes had on buying out many of the mafia elements within the town, government officials decided a change needed to happen. Uh, the state legislature, at the urging of Governor Laxall, passed the corporate gaming law in 1969. And that made it possible for corporations like Hyatt, Hilton, Kokorian's Tracinda Corporation, and others to come into Las Vegas. Headlining the corporate casino's entertainment bills were many well-established acts. Most notably, the king himself, Elvis Presley. From 1969 to 1977, Presley performed 837 sold-out shows in Las Vegas, making him the symbol of the town, almost iconic today as he was then. Another staple of Vegas entertainment was the town's most extravagant piano player, Liberace, who in 1975 became Vegas's top drawing performer, earning $125,000 a week. Liberace's offstage demeanor was often just as gracious and enthusiastic as his onstage persona, making him a favorite of many other Vegas entertainers. He was good for the industry. He brought something to the table. He didn't just take, and he used beautiful girls and great sets and costumes and cars, and he was just fun. But as audiences flocked to see performers at the new corporate-owned hotels, the last few mob-owned casinos were feeling the heat from the local, state, and federal government. Prosecutors from the organized crime strike force start lopping off the heads, if you will, of Chicago, Kansas City, and Milwaukee organized crime interests. They had uh, set up a, an extreme uh, bugging, uh, bugging system where Telephone conversations in a lot of the major hotels and their executive offices were bugged by the FBI. These investigations led to information about Chicago Mafia associates Frank Lefty Rosenthal and Anthony the Ant Spilatro. In 1973 and 74, a young real estate developer out of Southern California named Alan Glick got more than $60 million in Teamsters pension loans to buy the Stardust, Fremont, and Hacienda. Unknown to the public at the time was the fact that Glick was only a front man for the casinos, which were funneling money into the Chicago mob and were run on a daily basis by Rosenthal. Now he is from Chicago, and since they were kids, he had known Anthony Spilatro. And in the early 70s, Spilatro was sent out to Las Vegas by Chicago, essentially to move into an area that organized crime hadn't been that interested in before, which was street rackets, burglaries, and that sort of thing. In 1974, the Los Angeles Times reported that in the three years Spilatro had been in Las Vegas, more gangland-style murders had been committed there than in the past 25 years combined. This amount of attention was uncommon for most Vegas mobsters, but as Rosenthal secretly ran the casinos and worked the skim for Chicago, he rarely shied away from publicity. Rosenthal did columns for local papers. He had a TV show. This is the kind of thing that guys like Mo Dalitz uh, with the Desert Inn in the old days must have thought utterly ridiculous. Like Bugsy Siegel in the 1940s, Spilatro and Rosenthal's unwillingness to be discreet would lead to their downfall. In 1978, Rosenthal was denied a gaming license and narrowly escaped a 1982 attempt on his life when a car bomb destroyed his vehicle. Spilatro was not so lucky. His name was entered into the Black Book, forbidding him entrance to Vegas casinos. He was also brought up on murder charges, and though he was never convicted, it was clear he had gone too far when his battered body was found beside his brothers, buried in an Indiana cornfield.
After nearly eight decades of phenomenal economic and political fortune, Las Vegas began to experience a string of tragedies, starting in 1980 with a fire at the MGM Grand. 87 people were killed and over 700 were injured, making the hotel fire the second worst in United States history. This was followed shortly by another major fire at the Las Vegas Hilton, which killed eight people, and two smaller fires at Caesars Palace and the Riviera, which caused multiple injuries. In 1982, the renowned air demonstration squadron known as the Thunderbirds were displaying their precision flying maneuvers when a mechanical failure in the lead pilot's jet led to a disastrous accident. They were flying in formation. They learned to fly, follow the leader, and for some reason, the leader dived right into the desert. All the members of the team died. Yet another tragedy happened in May of 1988. The Las Vegas suburb of Henderson was home to the Pacific Engineering Production Company of Nevada, which manufactured a crucial ingredient in rocket fuel for the space shuttle. Starting sometime around 11.30 in the morning, the plant suffered a large fire, followed by two major and five minor explosions. Minutes after the final explosion, stunned and injured workers flocked away from the burning buildings to the nearby road for help. One worker said he hasn't seen anything like this since the Vietnam War. By the end of the day, two had died, hundreds had been injured, and nearly $100 million worth of damage had occurred. Las Vegas was also experiencing an economic slowdown, influenced heavily by the 1976 legalization of gambling in Atlantic City. This, coupled with the energy crisis of the late 70s and the canceling of Transworld Airlines' nonstop flight service from New York in 1983, factored into the stall in progress. Nevada and Las Vegas have been on a trajectory going up really since the end of World War II. But if there's a time where it was starting to level off a bit, it's during the 1970s and 80s. That would all turn around in 1989, when an idealistic young businessman drastically changed the direction of Las Vegas, cementing his name into the city's consciousness. Steve Wynn. 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 Stephen Allen Wynn moved to Las Vegas in 1967 after buying a small stake in the Frontier Hotel. For the next 20 years, he would work in the hotel and casino business dreaming and planning his vision for a brand new Vegas. I don't think anybody ever believed what Las Vegas could become until Steve Wynn made a bet that tourists were looking for something more than a place to gamble. And he started telling us what his ambitions were, that one of these days he'd build these big hotels on the Strip and there would be more uh, limousines per square inch than any city of its size. And uh, when he left, uh, <laughs> I said to my son, poor Steve, he's been working too hard. In 1989, Wynn's dream became a reality with the opening of the Mirage, the largest hotel the world had ever seen. In addition to its more than 3,000 rooms, it featured an indoor forest, giant waterfalls, and an outdoor volcano. Within a few months, it beat out Hoover Dam as the number one tourist destination in Nevada. When the Mirage was built, it changed the mentality of the guest coming to Las Vegas to expect so much more. When he had the opening for the Mirage, I sent him a wire and reminded him of that night and what I had said. And I, I, ended, I ended by saying, it's obvious that it was I who had been working too hard. The building of the Mirage ended a 15-year slump in construction on the Strip, which hadn't seen a major resort built since the early 70s. The next decade would be a very different story. The Dunes Hotel was the 10th resort on the Strip. Since it opened in 1955, it had grown to nearly 1,300 rooms, played host to Nevada's first topless show, and boasted a 180-foot sign that was among the most recognizable on the Strip. But by 1993, that just didn't cut it anymore.
After the success of the Mirage in 1989 and the construction of the new 5,000 room MGM Grand, Vegas was moving to the next level where mega resorts would rule. During the time I was mayor, we went from, I think it was 70 some thousand hotel rooms to almost 130,000 hotel rooms. This led to the destruction of many of the town's most loved and iconic landmarks. But the implosion of the sands brought forth the Venetian. From the rubble of the Hacienda emerged Mandalay Bay. From the destruction of the Desert Inn came the wind. And from the ashes of the dunes arose the Bellagio. And we actually went from 15 million tourists to 35 million tourists in less than eight years' time. Accompanying this surge in tourism was an increase in the size and production costs of entertainment, leading to theatrical-driven, complex presentations that had never been seen before. Some of these acts, like illusionist Siegfried and Roy, had been in Vegas for years, reaching a greater level of extravagance in the 1990s. Others, like Cirque du Soleil, brought a fine-tuned act to the town, finding immediate success and even greater potential for larger productions. We have 150 technicians that manage this show, give or take. We have 85 performers in the show, 10 musicians and 75 acrobats and dancers on stage. This is about 300 people. But it wasn't just entertainment and tourism helping Las Vegas prosper. In 1990, the University of Nevada Las Vegas men's basketball team helped put the university on the map when they won the NCAA championship game, beating Duke by a record 30 points. This night belongs to Las Vegas. They have won their first ever national championship and in three trips, the Shark comes away a winner in a record setting night, 103-73. At the same time, developers were also scoring major business deals as master planned communities such as Green Valley and Summerlin really took shape. By New Year's Eve 1999, Las Vegas had become the largest American city founded in the 20th century with a population of over 1.3 million people. The town celebrated in the typical Vegas style of immoderate, outrageous, and uncompromising fun. The new millennium is a minute and a half old, and I'll tell you, this is one big thrill. I will never forget this. There is no place like Las Vegas. As community leaders and history makers look toward Las Vegas' future, many are convinced the odds are in its favor. I think the future of Las Vegas is very bright. I mean, it's got to the point where the growth is almost geometric. We're excited about the future. I think uh, a lot of people are betting a lot of money. I think it, it's, the potential is limitless, and I would hope to see more shows. Get ready for the uh, Steve Wynn effect to go all the way up towards the Sahara Hotel. It's a very aggressive, city. We don't know the words, it can't be done. There's no reason uh, that I see that we should be slowing down. If not, uh, we should be improving. Vegas has really positioned itself so unique that no other city I think in the world can catch its energy. People come to Vegas, it's much uh, less expensive than going to a shrink. Las Vegas has positioned itself as the must-see destination of the entire world. This city has always been uh, boom, it's not boom and bust. We're seeing two billion dollar edifices going up all over. I mean, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. They're all very, very successful. I mean, every time they open one, you can't get in the parking lot. It's an unreal world out here. And so I don't think it, it, it will stop. I think it'll continue to reinvent itself. Everything comes in cycles. What was popular 30, 40 years ago is becoming popular again. So what's old is new, what's new is old, and, and the next phase is unknown but very exciting.